Thanks for coming tonight, guys. Uh, my name is Larry Silivra. I have a background, background in software development uh, and testing. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you not about that. I'm going to talk to you about uh, something called Block Store and Blockchain ID, um, which are really cool technologies that are built on top of Bitcoin, uh, but don't actually involve like sending money around or anything like that. Um, so first I want to talk about centralization. Um, let's think about some things that are centralized in sort of our digital world. Um, so there are things called domain names, which are uh, the names that you type into your web browser, so google.com, uh, facebook.com. Uh, these are centralized. They're controlled by a company based in the US called ICANN. Uh, it was originally uh, sort of the US government, but now it's sort of an a, a NGO, I guess, um, would be the best way to describe that. Um, another thing is called uh, IP addresses, which are those funny numbers that your, your computer gets when it connects to your network at home. Um, and your, your computers use these different numbers to sort of like talk to each other. Um, and the way the internet works is that every, every computer on the internet has to have like, its own unique number. Um, and the way that we go about like figuring out like who gets what number, like can PCCW use the same numbers as like HK broadband? This is all decided by like centralized organizations. So here in Asia, we have this um, an organization called uh, APNEC, uh, which is Asia Pacific uh, Naming something or anyway. But they, um, these companies like PCW, China Mobile, China Telecom, they apply to this organization for a whole block of IP address numbers, and they use these numbers um, to assign to their users, like you, your phone, uh, your modem at home, um, and they pick a number out of this pool and give it to you when you want to connect to the internet. Um, so that's centralized, and, um, and the Asia Pacific organization um, is under another organization called the uh, International Addressing and Naming Association, I think. Um, but it's also owned by ICANN, which again was something established through the U.S. government. So centralized. So at the top of both of these, you have a big pyramid. At the top is one organization, which is controlled by its own board of directors, and that sort of controls the internet. Another thing is um, this thing called SSL certificates. Um, so if you ever like bought something online um, or used Facebook, you probably noticed there's like a little bit, a little um, green bar that appears sometimes, um, or there are these words HTTPS in front of the address. Um, that indicates that the connection between you and Facebook or the e-commerce site that you're visiting is um, secure um, and has been verified to be owned by uh, that particular domain name or that particular organization. Um, and the way this, this whole system is like secured is through something called SSL certificates. And where do you get an SSL certificate? Well, you go to a company and buy it. And the way it works um, is that web browsers, Chrome, Safari, uh, Firefox, et cetera, um, they all trust certain companies to issue these certificates. Um, so at the top, so what you have is you have a bunch of in, like, smaller companies that sell certificates, and then there's like larger companies that like will issue trust to those smaller companies, and then like there's a whole group of large companies or organizations, maybe about 100 or so, that are in your web browser um, that are trusted. So you can actually go in and see what companies your browser is trusting, and that's all centralized. So, um, so for example, a company called VeriSign, which is one of, a big one in the US, they will issue a certificate, for example, maybe for Larry.com, if I was so cool on that, on that domain, um, and VeriSign, VeriSign would be saying, I trust that uh, Larry.com Larry is owned by this person that I've given the certificate to. And that's the only way that we know that like Facebook.com is actually, that we're connecting to is actually Facebook. Um, that's centralized. Um, and the next thing we have is uh, something like Facebook and Twitter. So Twitter, you have a, you have a screen name. Uh, Twitter issues, issue, issues you that username. So I'm Larry Salibra, he's Leo AW, he's uh, KTORN. Um, who decides who is that username? Twitter does. Uh, sure, you register, you have a password, you can change the profile, you can change your picture, but if Twitter doesn't like you, or if you violate their terms of service, or if they decide that, hey, somebody else should have this name, that's up to them. They can change that, it's centralized. Um, or, if, or if, for example, you tweet something that uh, maybe somebody who's powerful politically decides they don't want to have seen, they can go to, they can go to Twitter and say, hey, let's block this guy's account, let's, take his name away from him, centralization. Um, Facebook is the same way. Uh, exact same things I said just apply. Uh, Facebook is really interesting because they have something called a real name policy, um, which means that the name you use on Facebook has to be your real name. 
Um, they don't always check it, but like if they're suspicious, they'll ask you to provide government ID documents to make sure that the name on your Facebook is actually your name. Um, not a big deal for most people, um, but there are a lot of people who are transgender, transgendered, or they have a, you know, maybe they are born male and they feel like they want to use a female name or they want to use a name that represents their interests. Have a lot of trouble with Facebook because Facebook will block their account, won't let them use that name. So that's also centralization. Um, and I skipped one of the problems that we have with, uh, we have problems with domain names and SSL certificates uh, with centralization. Um, and actually, we can skip to the next, next uh, page and talk about those, some problems that we have. So we talked about problems with Facebook and Twitter. Um, we can talk about problems with uh, uh, the other items that I mentioned. So first one is single point of failure. So what does that mean? Um, so if you look at SSL certificates, um, or even domain names, uh, if you want, you're, you're sort of, when you use a domain name or use an SSL certificate, you're building your business on top of uh, that one thing. And if I want to compromise, for example, if you buy a certificate from uh, VeriSign, um, all I have to do to make my own certificate for your website is to go to any one of those trusted companies and hack into their system, bribe somebody inside the company, um, whatever, and then I can make a certificate that makes my, my web server look like it's your web server. Um, so, so when someone, so it's really easy to compromise the system because there's one point of failure. Um, this actually happens um, pretty frequently in the last few years. Like sometimes companies will uh, will issue certificates um, improperly because they made a mistake. Um, sometimes uh, some of these trusted organizations are owned by uh, governments, which may or not may not be friendly to you. Um, and sometimes they issue these certificates to uh, sort of read people's traffic. Next problem we have is something called a, a business or counterparty risk. Um, so uh, let's see a show of hands. Who in here has used login with Facebook? Have you ever logged into something else that's not Facebook with your Facebook account? Raise your hand. Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, most famous example is probably Tender. Of course, nobody here uses that, but <laughs> I've used it before. Um, and uh, you have to log in with Facebook. Uh, so there are a bunch of problems with logging in with, uh, with Facebook with, with your Tender account. Um, Let's, uh, let's talk about the counterparty <coughs> risk if you're tender and you're building on top of Facebook. Um, we've actually seen this with a famous company, I believe it's called uh, Z Zigna, the game, game maker of FarmBuild. They, um, they, made most of their, uh, they got most of their users from Facebook um, early on, um, very successful, made lots of money. Uh, and then uh, Facebook came to them and said, hey, uh, you, we see you're using Facebook apps and log in with Facebook to build a really profitable business. Like, uh, it would be nice if we had a piece of that too. Um, and so they, they changed the rules of the game, uh, sort of mid-business, mid uh, and that, that's cost a lot of money. Um, so when you build on login with Facebook, not only do you have that single point of failure, like when Facebook goes down, you can't log into Tender, big problem. Um, but you have this business counterparty risk. If I build on Facebook, Facebook owns my customer. Uh, if I do really well and Facebook changes their rules, Facebook can uh, they have an incentive to come get a piece of my money. Um, so these are some of the problems we have with that. Next one is regulatory risk. Um, so say I'm doing something that uh, right now it's legal, so I buy a domain name like, um, I don't know, fishingforducks.com, what? Bitcoin. <laughs> Bitcoin is a good example. I'm trying to use non-Bitcoin non things, but, but okay, we'll use Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin is, uh, is legal in most places. It's, it's certainly legal here in Hong Kong. Um, and so I build, build a business on this, and at some point, uh, somebody somewhere, maybe uh, let's say the U.S. government, for example, decides the word Bitcoin is illegal, can't be used in domain names. Um, so I have this great website, Bitcoin, BitcoinIsCool.com, and uh, I build like a, you know, lots of traffic. I get lots of ad revenue, and they, they go to they go to ICANN, the people that control domain names, just to say, hey, like yeah, Larry's not in America, but like we've decided here this this name can't be used anymore. Like take it away from him. Regulatory risk. I can't do anything about it. It's centralized. I don't have control. Um, censorship. So there's actually this is a really recent news. There's a new domain name called uh, .xyz. It's famous because uh, Google changed their name to Alphabet, and they bought I think it's Alphabet.xyz, um, or maybe it's ABC.xyz. ABC. Um, so it's a new domain name like .com, but it's .xyz. Recently, the uh, company that, that controls that uh, .xyz came out with a, a statement or, some, or something like that that said that they would be willing to, uh, to sort of adopt a list of, I think it was 10,000 um, banned words issued by the Chinese government. 
uh, words you can't have, which you can imagine are probably words like, uh, I don't know, like freedom or Falun Gong or whatever. Like, they said they would ban people from having those words in domain names. Um, censorship risk. So when you have a centralized system, um, whoever controls that system can tell you what is or what is not um, able to be used in that system. Um, the next is a security risk. Um, so security risk, uh, we sort of talked about that before. Um, when you have a single point of failure, um, it also becomes very attractive for bad people to attack that single point of failure. Um, which means that all of us with our domain, like you know, the internet and the domain name system, we all rely on this company called ICANN. Um, and if you go look on the internet, they have this, uh, this really crazy thing called like the root key signing ceremony, which is basically their way to make this like, it's actually like a ritual. A bunch of like cryptographers fly to some place and they do some fancy like motions with some numbers, um, but it's to make it appear that it's really secure. When in fact, if you just, you know, you go drinking with these guys and you convince them to like give them their passwords and sign your keys, you could take over the whole system. But they, they know that, the single point of failure, it's very dangerous, so they wanna make it look like it's very secure. Um, security risk. The last one is poor user experience. Um, who here has more than one uh, login and password? Who here has trouble like logging in, like remembering all these and like dealing with them? Okay, so right now the current system we have is like, it's really ridiculous. Um, like it's, it's very bad for users. Uh, we have uh, lots of passwords. We use tools like password managers that sort of help us manage that. Um, it's not very good. Um, but there are ways we can use systems built on Bitcoin on the decentralization to sort of, uh, if executed well, and make it so that you only have to remember one, one set of credentials, password or whatever, and then you can, um, you can like log in with any one, any device that's owned by you by just clicking like okay. Um, so there's a lot of potential, it, it's hard, don't get me wrong, but it's a lot of potential for the stuff I'm gonna talk about to make a really great user experience much better than what we have now and also be more secure. Okay, so now we're gonna get into some stuff that's a little bit technical and I apologize, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Um, so first thing I'm gonna talk about is this thing called Blockstore. Um, Blockstore is some really cool open source software. Um, it was built by, uh, I believe, three gentlemen um, who are from Princeton. Uh, they're based in New York. Uh, they, they work for a company called OneName, um, which they started. They raised some money and have been working um, to build this really cool technology. Um, and what is Blockstore? Blockstore is uh, really, in its essence, quite simple. Uh, it's what we call a key value store. Um, and so, to, for people who are not programmers here, a key value store, you can think of something like a dictionary or like a phone book, for those of you old enough to remember those, as a key value store. So in a phone book, the key is your name, the value is the phone number. So if you want to look, I want to look up Leo, for example, I will like open the phone book to the page with the L's on it and then look up, look up Leo and I'll find his phone number. Um, so block store is essentially a way to like take keys and value pairs and store them securely using uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. What does that mean? That means that if you put a, a key in Blockstore, you can uh, trust that the value that uh, goes with that key was only put there or updated by the person that controls that, that original key. Um, and how does that work? First of all, does any, everybody understand what I just said? Does it sort of make conceptual sense? Great. Um, so right here we have the, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain. These are the blocks that happen every 10 minutes or so. Um, and what Blockster does is it creates a virtual blockchain um, on top of a Bitcoin blockchain. And it uses that, it does that by using uh, this part of the Bitcoin blockchain, which I, I think was in Leo's diagram, but I don't believe he mentioned it. It's called Op Return. And it's just like um, in every Bitcoin transaction, there's a space where you can store some data. It can be any data. Um, and in this case, uh, uh, the people at the people who are Blockster have, have made it so that it uh, it stores some information, um, either uh, a name or a command that like essentially lets you build a virtual blockchain on top of the Bitcoin blockchain um, using a whole bunch of Bitcoin transactions. <laughs> um, and so in this virtual blockchain, what we do is we store um, we store some information, and then that information. Um, connects to like, that information is just the key. So for example, in the phone book analogy, it's just the name. Um, or in your domain name, for example, your domain name analogy, it's just the domain name. And then uh, it stores that, and it stores at like one very small value, um, which we can say is uh, called the value hash, um, which I'll talk about next page here in a second. 
Um, but then you use that, so you look up the key, um, and then, or the name, and then you get the value hash, and you use the value hash to look up like the real value in this thing called a distributed hash table. Um, so what's a distributed hash table? Uh, who in here has ever used BitTorrent? Or torrent or something, okay. Um, of course, I know it was just downloading uh, like an installation for Linux, it wasn't watching movies or anything like that, because people don't do that. Um, but uh, has, has anybody here ever like used BitTorrent but never actually had the torrent file, and instead just got had a link? Have you, those things called magnet links, have you seen those before? Okay, so a magnet link uh, is actually like just, is actually in this case, it's like a value hash, and it looks up the, the torrent in a, in a distributed hash table. And a distributed hash table is sort of a decentralized network of computers that each, each computer has part of this database. So you know, each computer has um, a bunch of torrents um, or whatever information. Um, so in this case, uh, what Blockster does is it, it uh, stores the values for all the names that are in this virtual blockchain in a distributed hash table. Um, and that's just a current implementation decision right now. Like, there may be better ways to store that, but this is sort of the, the method that, um, that has been chosen right now because it works really well with uh, BitTorrent. It works pretty well. Um, uh, next page. Oh, go ahead. So, so the miner not only save the blockchain, but also now also some distribute the, the information. That, uh, this doesn't affect miners at all. So this is just like miners mine their current uh, blocks. This is just like oh, well, the, well no, uh, the the thing that's stored blockchain. It, it doesn't it doesn't really affect uh, it doesn't affect the current blockchain at all. The Bitcoin blockchain. It just adds it adds a little bit of information to the Bitcoin blockchain. Now I'm going to show you an example in uh, in two slides. So hopefully that that will help. Just a couple of, uh, of important terms or components to know about this. So we have the namespace um, in block store. So what is a namespace? You can think of namespace like .com, .org, .xyz. It's sort of like the part after the period on your domain name. It's just a way to like um, divide names up into different types of names. Um, and in block store, um, different namespaces can have different prices for names or different rules for those names. For example, names can be just um, valid for a year or you can be valid forever. Um, that's what our namespace is. Um, so the key and our key value store um, in block store is the name plus the namespace. So name plus dot plus namespace. Um, value hash, which I mentioned before, is what we get when we look up the key in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and we use that value hash to find the real data we're looking for. Uh, Bitcoin, there's a Bitcoin address. Um, there's a Bitcoin address that owns the name in block store. So, um, and the person, and a Bitcoin address is actually just a public key. And there's a corresponding private key, and the person that has that private key, the, the private key for that Bitcoin address, they're the person that owns that name, uh, that block store name. And then there's something called the consensus, uh, which uh, the consensus just tells us at any given block. Um, so say this is block one, two, three, four, block four, what is the, we have a number that's like uh, a consensus at that block, which to make sure that that all of the names that are happened previously are all the same. So I can say my consensus is like ABC. I can compare it with Leo's consensus and make sure that at block four that our, both of our systems are in the same state. They have the same names. Uh, the names have the same data and everything's the same. Cool. Um, so the next thing I want to show you quickly is just sort of this concept of, of block stack architecture. And like, just to let you know, block stack is sort of like a, we're not really sure exactly what it means right now. Um, but right now, it's, it's, a, it's basically a community of developers and people that are interested in this technology. Um, so, uh, but the idea of block stack is we're trying to pull in people like that have different technology like this that will let you build decentralized applications and, and infrastructure. Um, so to take, this is another look at what we just talked about. So we have here the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and we have uh, these different components. And these are kind of technical terms. But so you can think of like state, a, a state engine basically is something that tells you like what is the current, like who has what name, um, what information is each name pointing at, like what is the whole like, what does the whole ecosystem look like? And that state engine gets its information from the blockchain. So that's one part. And then we have something called immutable storage. So for example, um, you can think of uh, data that you would store with your name. So um, I would store my picture perhaps, or I would store, uh, my location, or a bio, like a bio about me, like there he is a human being, um, or where I'm, uh, like what my Twitter handle is. I would want to store this information perhaps in immutable storage, um, and that means it can't be changed. That means that this storage 
is part of the information that we like calculate a hash on and gets stored as the, uh, the value hash in the Bitcoin blockchain. So we can, anything that's stored in the middle of storage, it can be anything, it could be like license numbers, it could be like securities, like stocks, whatever. Um, that's protected by the Bitcoin blockchain. So you can't, if you change it, you'll know from the blockchain that it's not somebody tried to change it. Then we have this other thing called like immutable storage. And this would be something like um, my picture, but instead of like um, the actual value of my picture, like perhaps I like to update my, my profile pic every day. And like, if we sort of that, like that doesn't need to be protected, um, but like we wanna know that I did it, but we don't, have, we don't really care like what the value is if it's changed. Um, so we would store here immutable storage, um, but instead of uh, being protected by the blockchain, we just signed it with my private key. So every time I updated it, it would get signed. That way people could verify that I, in fact, was the one that updated it, um, but they can't like verify like when it was updated, or for example, like how often it was updated, which is sort of a, uh, maybe there's some information like, you know, you posted something, but it was embarrassing, you wanted to delete it. Like this would sort of, mutable storage would let you do that. They'd know that you posted, but if you deleted it, people wouldn't really necessarily know. So can you just explain the state engine again? State engine is um, is like, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a database. Um, it sort of represents like how, like in the block storage universe, like how are things arranged? So for example, um, let's say we had a state engine for like this room. Like it would say like, it would have like a bunch of chairs in it and then we have like who is in what chair. That would be like the state of this room if the room was represented by a state engine. Um, and then maybe, maybe we had like a bunch of things we could do to the chairs. Like I could make the chairs electrocute each person, right? And then like I would change the state of the system. So if I electrocuted Leo, he would jump and he'd like go over there or something. So it's a state engine, it's just a way of to, a term to represent like a database or like something that represents the state, like the like arrangement or the like the type of ecosystem. Um, and then, oh, so the, the goal is like you put this all together and you have a nice like, um, in programming what you call API interface, like it's a way, it's like um, a sort of a, a plug or and some, like a plug and socket, like your British plugs and British sockets that you hear in Hong Kong, you plug it together nice, nice and neatly so that people can build apps on top of this without having to understand how all this works or having to deal with it. Um, next, okay, so one cool thing built on top of Blockstore is called Blockchain ID, um, which you can actually already use now. Um, and it's sort of like, you can imagine it as like your Twitter username um, or your Facebook. Uh, it has a bunch of information, like, I think I can probably show you mine, Let's do it here. Second. So this is my blockchain ID. You can see the information that's stored in it, like um, this, all this information is currently stored. Uh, it's protected by the Bitcoin blockchain. I can, you can prove who owns, like I can prove, prove that I own Twitter, that this account, I own this Facebook, I own this GitHub, um, stuff like that. So talk about blockchain ID quickly. Um, so blockchain ID is uh, something that where only the user, um, he is corrected by blocks, or only the user can change that information. Only the person that has that private key can change my uh, profile. Um, they're developing technologies There's, uh, called block, uh, blockchain ID authentication, which will sort of uh, let you log in with blockchain ID, like you log in with Facebook, Twitter, or Weibo. Um, and it uses the .id blockstore namespace. So that's like the default uh, namespace. Um, and the way we write it is we've sort of taken over Google Plus's little plus since they sort of failed. We've decided that like if on Twitter, if you write at in front of it, that's your Twitter. Like uh, with blockchain ID, if you write plus in front of it, people just assume that that's uh, blockchain ID. Um, I want to give you a quick uh, little live example, a little technical, but hopefully it will let you see that, that um, it's working. Okay, so I'm connecting here to, uh, to a node that I have that's running, um, running a Bitcoin node, and it's also running, <laughs> it's running a Bitcoin node, and it's also running um, Block Store. Now I can show you that complete for those of you who are tech people. So we have um, we got Bitcoin, Bitcoin D is running over here, um, and then we should have Block Store someplace else. It's not doing much right now. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with Block Store already. Um, 
you can like register names, you can like transfer them to other people. <coughs> you can store this data you're talking about, the immutable and immutable data, immutable and immutable data. You can create your own namespace. So for example, if you're a company and you wanted to use this to register your digital assets, your movies, you could create like dot Sony, right? And then Sony can register all of their movies in the system. Um, and doing all this stuff has, do, doing many of these has like a cost in terms of Bitcoin. Um, cool, so I will show you, uh, first of all, how to look up my blockchain ID with this command line. Hopefully it won't fail this time. So right now it's, uh, it's it was, grabbing out of the state engine, it was grabbing Larry.id, it was looking for the value the value uh, hash, and then it was going to the distributed hash table to pull out this information, which is my profile. And this is exactly the same information you saw on that nice website, um, except here it's in um, it's in JSON format, which is uh, like a notation that makes it very easy for computers to read. So you can see all this information, like um, my picture here, proof of that I own my GitHub, my GitHub username, et cetera. Um, the next thing you can do is you can see the information about that name in the blockchain. And this is the information um, that is used to uh, see who owns this name, um, what's happened in the past. So I'm gonna quickly go tell you about a couple parts of this information. So here at the top of this record, we have this, uh, this which you'll all recognize as a Bitcoin address, hopefully. This is the owner of this um, ID. You can see which Bitcoin block, when it was first registered. And then there's a whole list of here of history in terms of Bitcoin block number of what happened. So at this block, um, this there's a, a, a transaction was done. It was a, this name informed transaction. Um, this is how much money was paid to do that transaction, that's in Satoshi's. Um, who imported the address, uh, where the, like this is a transaction number, where the money was sent, who sent it, their public key, and what Bitcoin transaction ID you can find this. Um, and this is the value hash, which is at that time, the hash of my profile was like calculated out to this. Um, and so I ch like every time I update my profile, it essentially makes a new record here. Um, and I want to show you, so right here we have, um, I'm going to copy this, this Bitcoin address and then show you how we can see it on the Bitcoin blockchain. Oh, I already have it here. So this is just a blockchain explorer for uh, many blockchains, but we're going to use the Bitcoin one. So I've got the address here in the box. We're going to search for the address. Okay, so this is um, my Bitcoin address because I own the name. Um, and these are the, the history of transactions of this Bitcoin address. So this, this two months ago was when it was created. Um, that was because it was moved from a previous uh, storage system. Um, and these are when I updated my profile. I made some changes to my uh, biography, I believe. Um, so we're gonna look at one of these transactions when it was created two months ago. So you can see here in this blockchain explorer, uh, the blockchain explorer, you can see that in this explorer they've added some logic to be able to understand blockchain IDs. And this is this is the data it was sent. So ID is the name. ID is like the code that lets people know that in op return this is a, a block store uh, transaction. And here we have a the name Larry.id. Um, and you can see what happened was that they they paid. Um, the, the place where I register my name paid uh, this amount of Bitcoin um, to do, conduct this operation. Okay, so what's next? Um, this is a very like active, like currently being developed in work, like in progress, uh, beware construction project. Um, so right now, uh, things to do are to develop client libraries for developers, so people that want to integrate either looking up names through this or using this for login, um, different languages, so that needs to be done. Um, we need to have more registrars, so like GoDaddy, we need like people who are like GoDaddy, blockchain ID names. 
Um, right now, the main one is the people that wrote this library called uh, One Name. Um, we need applications uh, for different platforms. But I, when I say applications, though, I mean like blockchain ID, like like an application on your phone that would store your private key and that would let you be able to log in with blockchain ID. Um, and so the, the user experience for that will be something like you click on a link in your browser or an app, it like an iPhone, it sort of switches to that other app, you click OK and log in, and it switches back to that app and you're logged in. Um, and those are currently under development. Um, the other thing we need to do is we need to scale Bitcoin. Um, this is actually a big problem for this application. Uh, so to register uh, a name, I believe it generally needs about four Bitcoin transactions. Um, so if you think about how many people we have in the world, we have like, what, seven billion times four. Uh, right now, that's, uh, I don't know what the number is, but look, currently I think we can only scale to about 12 million users with the current block size. I'm not 100% not sure on that, but the number is in the single or double digit millions. Definitely can't replace Facebook right now, unless we can learn how to scale Bitcoin, increase the block size, or do something else. Um, and then uh, think about other applications for technology. So whether it be a way to register license plates, cars, um, stocks, like whatever you can come up with, right? And then uh, here's how you can learn more. You can uh, go to blockstore.org. Um, there's a Slack, very active. There are about three to 400 people in it right now. Um, you can uh, join the forum, uh, post a question, read about uh, what people have discussed. Uh, you can uh, sign up for my newsletter, which I write every week um, about sort of decentralized psychology, um, or you can tweet at me. Thanks. Any questions? Thank you.